Well, welcome back to Finance Uncut. On today's episode, is Adam Smith responsible for Marxism? So I've just finished reading Murray Rothbard's Economic Thought Before Adam Smith. It's a big book, 574 pages. And basically, he has a real go at Adam Smith. Um, one for being a plagiarist and stealing uh, Cantillon's work after meeting Turgo in France, uh, which is where Smith began writing his Wealth of Nations. And I'm currently reading volume two. Uh, classical economics and uh, so far uh, he blames Adam Smith for also influencing uh, Thomas Malthus. Uh, for those of you who don't know of the Malthusian trap, uh, it argues uh, the economy can't support a growing population, which also influenced Charles Darwin and followers of population control, which is uh, very... Uh, interesting or, or modern uh, conversation that's happening around the world at the moment. Um, definitely some people that uh, support, uh, yeah, I can't even say. Anyway, uh, but however, the, the interesting thing is Malthus actually later recanted his position uh, after the Industrial Revolution. However, like many uh, thinkers, economists, philosophers at the time, when they put stuff out there that's incorrect, sometimes it's too late, damage is done. Um, also, Malthus um, had a, a, an impact or an influence on John Maynard Keynes, especially around the demand supply mismatch or, or gluts, so to speak. And obviously then that... Uh, influence Keynes and you know we've since since then we've got this um, you know massive government intervention um, also Rothbard blames Smith in particular uh, his labor theory of value which folks has proven to be incorrect so those of you who do um, like the classical economic school of thought We'll come to that in a sec. I'll touch on that in a sec and how and why that has been proven to be incorrect. However, that labor theory of value, and I agree with Rothbard here, that enraged Karl Marx because Karl Marx believed that workers were being exploited, uh, which obviously led to his writings of the Communist Manifesto. And well, we know what Marxism has led to around the world um, since then, millions and millions of of deaths uh, since then. Now, I I may have spoken, in fact, I think I have uh, shared this book before by uh, Dr. Mark Skousen, Vienna and Chicago Friends of Foes, and I really, really enjoyed it. Um, now, I'm trying to think. There There is a review on the Mises uh, website. Um, I'm just trying to think who wrote the review. And they did rip into um, Mark Skousen for this book. And, and I, I understand um, why, uh, you know, Mark was, was uh, critiqued this way. Um, however, I, I thought it was a, a good book and, and I enjoyed it. However, there's a few things that I uh, do have issues with and Mark basically praises Adam Smith in this book, gives him way too much credit, doesn't really mention Richard Cantillon uh, as really the founder of modern economics or, or capitalism, free markets and whatnot. Um, and this whole uh, debate, Rothbard, uh, that, that, that Rothbard argues that, uh, um, you know, Adam Smith's labor theory of value enraged Karl Marx Mark, in this book, kind of excuses Adam Smith and says, no, 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 it wasn't Adam Smith. It was his followers, um, Ricardo and, and Mill. And, and it was their theories that enraged Karl Marx. Um, either or, whatever, it, their theories 
were influenced by Adam Smith. So, yeah. But nonetheless, uh, those of you who understand Austrian economics uh, can read this book and see the things that, you know, Mark kind of not so much gets wrong, he just leaves out. Um, if you don't, then uh, you will probably won't understand that. But anyway. So I'll put a link in the description below to the Human Action Podcast, in particular this episode where Jeff Dice uh, discusses uh, Rothbard's critique on Adam Smith. In fact, he rips him a new one. Uh, that's Rothbard on, on Smith. And on, the, on this episode, he has Hunter Hastings, who is defending Adam Smith. And on the other side, we've got Professor Jonathan Newman, who's in uh, Team Rothbard. And it's a really, really, really good uh, conversation that they have. But what we'll do is we'll just cut to a clip, uh, which is all audio, folks. This is just an audio uh, podcast. We'll just cut to a clip on this where uh, they discuss Rothbard's critique of Adam Smith. Well, Hunter, I got to admit, um, I was a little self-indulgent here. I like the idea of an Englishman defending a Scot. So I, I, I thought I'd bring you on for Adam Smith. And, you know, big picture, overarching, if you just start uh, this portion of the book, which for those who are reading along, we're, we're specifically discussing chapters 15, 16, and 17. In other words, the final three chapters of volume one. Boy, oh boy, Hunter, um, he goes after Adam Smith pretty hard. I mean, he calls him retrograde. He says, uh, Cantillon, not Adam Smith, was the founder of modern economics. Uh, he says he put us, uh, you know, behind in terms of our understanding of uh, value and cost theory. I mean, uh, th this reads a little bit like a polemic with respect to Smith. Well, it does. And uh, Dr. Patrick Newman was very upfront about that in episode two of this series, where he said that Murray Rothbard had an open tendency to choose the individuals he supported and the theories he supported and those he didn't. And he was very... He was very direct about it. And this is one of those cases. I think polemic is a good word, but it's also uh, ad hominem. He, he calls Adam Smith a plagiarist. He calls him uh, incalcitrant and, and uh, various other things. So the, the polemic is deliberate, and it's to set up the last seven or so paragraphs of, of chapter 17, which I'm sure we'll get to during this discussion, of the... Uh, negative effect of Smith on the development of economics. So that's his purpose. And then so he sets out from the very beginning, the very first words of chapter 16 in uh, destroying the, the legend of Adam Smith as he sees it. So yes, it is a polemic. It's deliberate, but it's got a cause. So to me, Cantillon's book, Essay on the Nature of Commerce in General Economic Theory, as it's uh, more well known, was written 40 years before Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. And, and we know that Adam Smith began writing Wealth of Nations when he was in France meeting with Turgot. And, you know, Turgot, it's clear, had a relationship with Cantillon and was familiar. So uh, obviously Smith knew who Cantillon was. But when you read the two books, when you read The Wealth of Nations and you read uh, Economic Theory, it does seem clear to me that he did exactly what, according to Rothbard, said, and that he plagiarized Cantillon's subsistence theory of wages. In fact, in parts, is it's almost word for word. Uh, now, Cantillon's work was also liberally plagiarized by Malachi Postlethwaite in his 1749 Universal Dictionary of Trade and Commerce. So uh, Cantillon's been ripped off um, quite a lot, and, and, and he deserves a lot more credit uh, than history gives him. Now, it wasn't just Rothbard who ripped into Adam Smith. Uh, the uh, great Austrian economist Joseph Schumpeter uh, did also in his 1954 book, History of Economic Analysis, where he said, and I quote, the, rena the renowned economist, as in Smith, seems to have had no inkling of the Industrial Revolution going on all about him. Into this complacent miasma of Smith worship, writing with thinly veiled contempt, Schumpeter generally denigrated Smith's contribution and essentially held that Smith had shunted economics off on a wrong road, a road unfortunately different from that of his continental forebears. And what Schumpeter 
basically argues is that we had the Spanish scholastics and you know the French economists uh, like to go and um, and Cantillon, and then we had the marginal revolution with um, you know the uh, Austrians and um, walrus and um, whatnot, and and Smith took us onto a wrong path, which led to Marxism and communism and just the terrible things that have happened uh, since. A lot of that critique is based on what Rothbard considers Smith's uh, misunderstanding of any sort of theory of value, the idea that, that we, we look at cost of production even with respect to money, that you know, general labor cost of production uh, to apply even to the money commodity, which Rothbard says is a faulty theory of money. So I guess the thread that's going through all of it that, again, seems obvious to us in hindsight, not so obvious at the time, is that how do we determine uh, value and utility without understanding subjectivism and marginalism? And uh, Smith attempts to do so without uh, addressing subjectivism or marginalism. Well, Rothbard hits him, hits him on this as well. Uh, Rothbard says that um, we don't, we're not just relying on hindsight by saying that Adam Smith made this error in his value theory, because Rothbard points to Adam Smith lectures that he made uh, years before he wrote The Wealth of Nations, where he actually did mention subjective value theory, where he, he basically had solved the diamond water paradox. But then later on, when he wrote The Wealth of Nations, it, it seems like he, it's almost as if he forgot what he wrote before. So, so we can't you know, just say from hindsight, oh, Smith just didn't realize this. Rothbard shows that in, in his earlier lectures, uh, uh, Smith wasn't uh, consistent. Yeah, so, and, and this is the other big issue that I, I have with classical uh, economics uh, and, and Smith's diamond water paradox, which went unsolved until the later economists combined uh, two theories, subjective valuation and marginal utility, hence the marginal revolution. So the labor theory of value basically states that the price of a good reflected the amount of labor and resources required to bring it to market. And Smith believed that diamonds were more expensive than water because they are more difficult to bring to market. And once again, this is what kind of enraged Marx is. He thought that the workers were being exploited. Uh, but the labor theory suffers from many problems. The most pressing is that it cannot explain the price of items with little or no labor. Or, for example, I don't know, let's say... Um, let's say I, I build a horse... You know, a, a, a buggy that attaches to a horse um and let's say i make you know 10 million of them well am i going to sell them i mean i've put a lot of labor into making those things am i going to sell them i might sell some some people might like them as a as a bit of a i don't know uh, antique type thing but there's no demand there's no subjective value there's no uh marginal utility there um so but in regards to the diamond um paradox suppose that a perfectly clear diamond naturally developed uh with a with a an amazing cut uh and it was discovered by a, a guy going on a hike so the problem is or the question is does the diamond fetch a lower market price than a very you know the very same diamond um that was mined, cut, and cleaned by human hands? Well, clearly not, right? Um, at the end of the day, the buyer doesn't care about the process, but only cares about the final product. And that's where we get uh, subjective value. And what economists discovered was that costs do not drive price. It's actually the opposite. Prices drive costs. This can be seen with a bottle of expensive French wine. The reason the wine is valuable is not that it comes from a valuable piece of land, that it's picked by highly paid workers or is chilled by an expensive machine. It is valuable because people really enjoy drinking good wine. People subjectively value the wine highly, uh, you know, which in turn makes the land and that it comes from even more valuable and makes it worthwhile to construct machines to chill the wine, et cetera. So, you know, subjective 
prices are what actually drive costs or subjective values is what uh, drives uh, costs. And with the diamond water paradox, uh, you know, subjective value shows why, or not why, but how diamonds are more e expensive than water because people subject subjectively value them more highly. However, it doesn't explain why diamonds should be more valued uh, or more highly than, than essential goods like water because we need water to survive, right? However, as I said before, um, three economists uh, Jevons or Stanley Jevons, uh, Karl Menger from the Austrian school, the founder of the Austrian school, and Leon Walrus discovered almost simultaneously, and that's you know well known. Um, and they explained that the economic decisions were based on marginal benefit rather than on total benefit. So basically, consumers are not choosing between all of the diamonds in the world versus all of the water in the world. Clearly, water is more valuable as an essential resource because we need it for life, right? Compared to luxury of um, you know owning diamonds, um, but as demand increases, consumers must choose between one additional diamond versus one additional unit of water. This principle is known as marginal utility, and this is where we had the marginal uh, revolution. How do we determine the value of things? Aristotle had asked a question that remained unanswered through centuries. Why water that is vital for all life is cheap, while diamonds are expensive, even though we can live without them. We had to wait a long time for an answer provided by economic law of diminishing marginal utility. Imagine that all you have is merely one apple. It is really precious to you because it allows you to satisfy your hunger and stay alive. For you, this apple is absolutely essential, and you have to eat it right away. After that, you decide to go for a walk, and you come across two more apples. You were very satisfied with your find, so you eat the second apple to your heart's content. You decide to keep the third apple for later, because you are already full. As you stroll further, you stumble on a whole orchard with hundreds of apples hanging from trees. It seems to you that your biggest dreams come true, so you decide to settle down near the orchard. After a mere week, you grow tired of the apples. In fact, at this time, a mere thought of their taste seems nauseating to you, and you can't even look at them any longer. Your neighbor Gregory has a pear farm only a few hundred yards away from your orchard. He has the same problem you have, only with his pears. He's been eating them for a few months now, and he is fed up with them. So you meet with him and you both agree to exchange your produce. One pear from Gregory's farm is worth much more to you than your apple. But the exchange is still fair, because Gregory values your apple much more than he values one of his pears. This story provides several important points. Each additional unit of a given good satisfies a less important need. The first apple appeases your hunger, letting you survive. The second apple fills you up. The third apple can be saved for later, thus satisfying your need to avoid future hunger. This implies that each additional apple you have is worth less to you, the first one was a priceless necessity needed to avoid starvation. The second one was merely a pleasurable snack. With each consecutive apple, its worth fades away in your eyes. There are no goods of fixed value. They are valuable as long as people value them, and only to that extent. Imagine yourself one day, finding a large and heavy statue bought many years ago by your grandfather, a sailor by trade, for your grandmother, a young woman then. You don't really like the statue, it's only collecting dust. You decide to sell the statue to get rid of it. You think to yourself, if someone would only pay for its delivery, then it would save me the trouble of throwing it out. It turns out that the price of the statue skyrocketed to $500,000 because of bids made by two eccentric and rich art collectors. In fact, they searched for the statue for the last 10 years because it was the last piece of a collection they were both trying to complete. This example shows that one and the same good can be valued very differently by different individuals. Let us go back to the question posed by Aristotle. In case of a massive drought, everyone would value water more than even the rarest of diamonds. We have no real use for diamonds while we are dying of thirst, but where there is plenty of water, our thirst may be quenched easily. Typically, we value diamonds much more than water, because when we have shelter, we don't suffer from hunger nor from thirst then we tend to satisfy our more sophisticated needs like aesthetics. Diminishing marginal utility is true for money too. If you don't have any money at all, then $1,000 will change your life substantially. 
You can use the money to rent a humble flat and buy some food. Although it won't be a fancy existence, it will still be a huge positive change in your quality of life as compared with being homeless and constantly starved. But if your monthly income is $5,000, then another $1,000 won't improve your quality of life that much. Obviously you still want it. It will still be a substantial gain, but it won't be a matter of life or death anymore. If your income is $1 million, you might not notice another $1,000. It may even not be desirable at all, because one million dollars a month may pay for all of your material needs, and for you such things as love, time spent with your family, your own health and leisure may hold even more worth. As those things cannot be bought, you may consider chasing additional money as futile, and choose to rather spend your time with your family. Well, this chapter also spends quite a bit of time going to Thomas Malthus. We all know Malthusian thought, uh, his famous 1798 essay on the principle of population, my sense was that Rothbard hangs Malthus on Smith, uh, perhaps a little unfairly, but nonetheless, uh, this idea that you know population is going to exceed the uh, subsistence ability of uh, the economy, you know that Hoppe talks about that, but he's talking about pre-agrarian societies. He's talking about early human societies, which are utterly reliant on the game or other sustenance they can yield from a particular area. And so when they have more and more kids and, and the, the region is not replenishing that game or other sub, uh, subsistence uh, rapidly enough, then that'll naturally limit the size of the tribe. But here, I mean, it, it, it seems clear and obvious to us in hindsight that Malthus is a bit of a crazy person with his uh, you know, obsession uh, with uh, population size, and that's the ultimate central planning, wouldn't it be? If if a government or a nation state said, "Well, we got to listen to Thomas Malthus and control how many kids people have," but uh, you know, I'll I'll ask Hunter what what what's what's the story with this uh, cul de sac of Thomas Malthus and the time Rothbard spends on him? Yeah, I'm not sure about that. He was trying to, I think, denigrate Smith by saying Smith was responsible for Malthus. Right. <laughs> as, he, as he was ultimately responsible for Marx, which I don't buy that uh, connection. If you read Smith, he said there could be a tendency in, um, in uh, pre-agrarian or agrarian societies for pr um, population growth to outstrip the productivity of agriculture, but it never happens because uh, innovation and, and productivity and the specialization of labor always get us producing more and more, and that grows faster than the population grows. Um, and I think Rothbard says that um, Malthus had to admit that in the final edition of his book, which was much different than the first edition, which was the crazy edition. So mm -hmm. uh, A, you can't hang it on, on Smith, and B, Smith probably changed Malthus's mind. Well, I'll let Jonathan have the last word, and, and uh, Hunter brings up the idea of even trying to hang Marx on Adam Smith. And so I want to get your thoughts on this. Uh, in the final pages of the book, Rothbard essentially says, look, the, if you accept the labor theory of value or the production cost theory of value, which uh, supposedly, presumably everyone did, and some, many people still do, but everyone did prior to the marginal revolution, um, that this necessarily and inexorably and naturally leads us to Marxism. Uh, do you agree with this, or is this hyperbole? I, I guess we can't really know if if Marxism would have been developed, if Marx would have developed all of his ideas without Smith. So w would there have been this idea of exploitation of labor because because we see that the the price of the product is more than what's being paid to to laborers? Or would we have this idea of alienation, or would we have all these other ideas associated with market, Marxism that we that we see sort of you know vague beginnings in Smith? We can't really know for sure what would have happened or how how the the history of ideas would have would have developed. But perhaps if if it's the case that those ideas would have developed without Smith's writings, or even if Smith had been stronger on the you know the natural rights, natural liberty. A uh, system of natural liberty ideas. If he had been more explicit there, it it could be that Rothbard is giving Smith more credit than what Smith is due. So it could be that that Rothbard is 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 elevating Smith's uh, importance in the same way that he's denigrating others who elevate Smith's importance. If, if that makes any sense. So it's almost like he's saying all these people. 
they they praise Smith and they they uh, think that his writing is just amazing and and it was he's the founder of modern economics. But if Rothbard, in the same breath, says, "Look at all of these things, all these bad ideas that that start in Smith," um, it it could be that that Rothbard is you know committing the same error that he's accusing others of doing, which is you know giving too much credence, uh, giving uh, a Smith too much credit um, there. But but what's interesting is to compare this book to the book that Mark Skousen wanted this book to be. Uh, I've used I've used both books in in my own uh, classes of history of economic thought. I, I've assigned readings from Rothbard, but I've also um, assigned Mark Skousen's book. Uh, this book, uh, Rothbard's book, was initially commissioned by Skousen to be a, a short undergraduate uh, textbook on history of economic thought. Um, but when when the project was taking longer than both Rothbard and Skousen anticipated. Uh, Skousen decided to write his own um, version, and also uh, Rothbard uh, died in the process. So, but if you compare the content of the books, they're totally different, especially in their treatment of Smith. Uh, wh what's really interesting is that Smith is at the end of Rothbard's book, but Smith is at the very beginning of Skousen's book. So Skousen sets up his history of economic thought as it all began with Adam Smith and it, it, we had all of these great ideas that you know started you know as little seeds in Adam Smith and turned into this this great project of free market economics later on, including he would put Austrians in that same vein as you know uh, economics that's based on you know free market principles. But then when you read Rothbard, it's the exact opposite. It's very it's very dense. It's very detailed. Adam Smith is not the founder in the slightest. In fact, he wrote a whole book that's about economics before Adam Smith. And then once he finally gets to Adam Smith, he doesn't have a lot of nice things to say. So it's really interesting just to see how those two books turned out. So is Adam Smith responsible for Marxism? Well, Rothbard definitely argues that that point. Um, Joseph Schumpeter at least says that Smith had shunted economics off onto a wrong road. And that road, uh, unfortunately, uh, has led us to where we are today and what we've seen with uh, communism throughout the world and, and Keynesianism and interventionism, left, right and centre. And so certainly there's that argument there. Um, what I would argue is that Richard Cantillon uh, deserves way more credit and Richard Cantillon is you know, arguably... Uh, the founder of modern economics, not Adam Smith. Uh, so I definitely would argue that to be the case. Uh, did Adam Smith plagiarize Cantillon? I think in parts he did. Um, I think Adam Smith's best work is his uh, Moral Sentiments, his first book, not uh, The Wealth of Nations. So... Yeah, if you haven't read Adam Smith and you want to read, uh, I think definitely his first work was much, much better. Um, I would much uh, more recommend reading Cantillon's uh, Economic Theory or reading, you know, um, uh, Menger's uh, uh, Economic Principles um, or, you know, even better, Rothbard's uh, Man, Economy and State. Um, but what do you guys think? Do you guys think that Adam Smith um, is responsible for Marxism, uh, his labor theory of value? Uh, do you guys think that uh, Adam Smith is the founder of modern economics or, or is it Richard Cantillon? Anyway, guys, if you like this video, hit that like button. Uh, I'd love to see your thoughts and opinions in the comments below. If you um, haven't yet subscribed, do so. Hit that notification bell as well. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you again on another episode of Finance Uncut.